Okay, let's get started. Um, today we're going to talk about opposition strategy. Now, the lecture is labelled opposition strategy and note taking. I'm not going to spend too long on note taking because I think that's a little patronising to teach you how to write things down on a piece of paper. So you might be beginners in debate, but I think you're all capable of, you know, writing things. So. We'll do, deal with note-taking very, very quickly at the beginning, and then we'll hopefully we won't have to mention it again. But what we are going to talk about, and in some detail, is what good opposition strategy is. So we're going to talk about the general lines of opposition, things that you will constantly need to be questioning government on, right through the debate, from top half down to the bottom half. Things like, is this genuinely a problem? Have they identified a problem that needs solving? Will their solution in any way work to solve that problem? What are the harms that you can foresee that might outweigh the benefits that they propose they will bring? Is there a better way of doing what they want to achieve? And will what they try and do have any practicable effect on wider society as a whole? Now we're going to go into some depth and look at the nature of harms and why harms and benefits often are miscompared in debates, particularly by oppositions. Harms and benefits need to clash directly just as arguments do. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look about the <coughs> irreversibility of harm. We're going to look at the numbers game. My, I have more people getting hurt than you have people being benefited. The utility argument. We're going to look at <coughs> why uh, involuntary harm, according to some moral philosophers, is always 10,000 times worse. We're going to look at agency, and we're going to look at immediacy. And that's going to lead us on to the idea of models. Agency and immediacy are two elements of a model that we might want to question. So again, we're going to look at effectiveness of a model, alternatives to <coughs> the agent, and speed. But before we get into any of that, because I haven't met most of you guys yet, so I should feel I should tell you a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Rigan. I'm from the UK. Um, I have studied at the University of Oxford, University of Birmingham. Uh, I have taught at the University of Birmingham, Leiden, Helsinki, at three different universities in Turkey. I've taught at WDI, at Tuna, at summer school. Um, I have far too many degrees for anybody to want to employ me, so I created my own business, um, teaching, debating, public speaking, because there was nothing else that I could do. Um, and I'm as passionate as I suppose anybody could be, particularly about English as a second language debating. I do most of my work in Eastern Europe right now, particularly in the Balkans, Ukraine, Russia, places like that. But also because I recognize the difficulties of standing up, making a speech when it's not in your first language. I'm one of the few English people who's been brave enough to try and debate in a foreign language. And I felt like I was six years old. Honestly, because I knew in my head that I had great arguments, but then I didn't have the vocabulary to bring out those arguments really quickly, so I'd spend two minutes trying to explain the one word I couldn't think of in the debate. So I don't want anybody here to feel embarrassed if they stumble over words or if they have to put their hand up and say, whoa, what did you just say now? Okay, that's absolutely fine. It's perfectly understandable. And in fact, the only stupid people are the ones who never ask questions. Okay? So ask every question you feel necessary. That's how we get more knowledge. That's how we make sure that we're not falling down. Because if you don't ask a question, and it's something crucial to what I'm going to talk about later on, you're going to lose that bit as well. So I'd rather you stop me and say, hang on, can you explain that a little better, please? Because if I'm not explaining it right, it's not your fault that you don't understand. It's my fault as the teacher. Okay? So that's the first and only rule we have. Nobody feels embarrassed about putting up their hand and asking a question. When somebody is speaking, whether it's me or whether it's one of you, we all give our attention to that person. Okay? We show that person the same respect that we would want if we were the ones speaking. Is that okay with everyone? Good. Okay. <coughs> now, I'm going to tell you a little story, because as Tuna just said this morning, one of the things I do is I'm a raconteur. I get paid to speak after dinner when businessmen are drunk, which is great fun. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know why they pay me. Apparently, I'm meant to be quite amusing. I think that's always in direct proportion to the amount of alcohol they've consumed by that point. 
I'm going to tell you a little story about my friend Dave. My friend Dave is great at arguing with people, just because. He is the perfect opposition speaker. He is, in fact, so good at arguing with people, he has almost no friends left. <laughs> he is so good at arguing with people, he no longer gets invited to parties because people are afraid of how good he is at arguing with them. And Dave has some really, really good ideas about how to argue with people, even if you know nothing about what they're saying. The first thing Dave says is drink more alcohol yourself. Because if you're at a party and somebody says, has strong views on the Peruvian economy, and you're drinking grapefruit juice, you might not have any strong views on the Peruvian economy. If you drink a lot of vodka, you'll suddenly discover a burning desire to express everything you, that you don't know about the Peruvian economy. Dave also says, make things up. You know, if you don't know something, make it up. And if somebody says, did you make that up? Then make up more stuff about how specific it is and say, why haven't you read this? <laughs> Dave also says, use meaningless but important sounding words like vis-a-vis -vis and per se and qua. Because Dave reckons that using Latin makes you sound more intelligent. Okay? <laughs> So if you use Latin, what it really means in a debate is, I speak Latin and you don't, therefore I win. <laughs> Dave also says you can use snappy and irrelevant comebacks <coughs> as well. Like, you're begging the question, or you can't compare apples and oranges. These are always applicable, according to Dave. And if all else fails and you can't find anything else to oppose your opponent with, compare them to Adolf Hitler. But do it subtly. Such as, that sounds suspiciously like something Hitler said. <laughs> now that's how Dave reckons you should argue. And unsurprisingly, Dave's not that good. So I don't want you to do any of those, okay? I don't want you to make things up. I don't want you to use words that you think sound clever. I don't want you to get personal and make snappy comebacks at people. All that does is cheapen things. Opposing an argument is not like when you're five years old and you're in the playground and Nah, 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 nah. Is, isn't, is, isn't, is, isn't. That's not great, okay? Particularly not in debate, but in any walk of life. Best opposition is always one that is considered, <coughs> that is measured, and that is targeted at what has just been said. You will often find judges who criticize oppositions for opposing something that the government team did not say for imagining that they heard something. Or worse, and I've seen some opposition teams do this, they can't find an opposition to what government have said, so they pretend that government said something else and then oppose that, thinking that's a better line of <coughs> But the first thing you have to do is you have to deal with what has been said. You have to consider it, and you have to be able to tackle it directly. So that's why your note-taking does matter. As I said, I'm not going to talk about note-taking too much. But you will have all seen how judges flow a debate. Different judges do it in different ways. But there will always be some form of box where we can write down government's <coughs> arguments and opposition's arguments right on the other side of the page. And we can draw lines as to where they clash. And that's what you guys should be doing. You shouldn't just be writing down your speech. You should be flowing what's gone before in the debate. And it's important because only then can you make sure that you're tackling all the things that you need to tackle. Okay? So get used to flowing debate like judges do. Practice that in your training sessions as well. Practice just writing flows. When you watch the videos from Tuna's WDI website or from his UVM website, flow the debates before you stand up and say, okay, I would oppose this by saying X, Y, and Z. Once you've got that, you can then start to focus on, okay, what do I really, really need to tackle here? And there are five questions, or five things that government will always attempt to do. And very often when we look at opposition, we're just looking at the flip side of government. Government should always say what the problem is, why it's a problem that needs solving, what their proposed solution is, why their proposed solution is going to work, and why it's a better option than anything else that you can think of. And they should be doing it in that 
basic order. So you need to flip those questions around. You don't necessarily need to stick to the same order, but you do need to flip those questions around, particularly if you're the opening opposition team. So you need to, the first thing you need to be thinking about, even before you stand up to speak, while they're still in that first protected unit, think, okay, is this a problem? Have they identified a problem that needs solving? Because if they haven't, what's the implication of that? If they haven't identified a problem that needs solving, what's the implication? There's no problem. There's no problem, and therefore... It's you, their, their plan is not going to work, there's no problem. Yeah. Every, every there's, there's no point doing anything about it. All the money they want to spend, all the energy, all the time, all the effort that they want to use up solving this non-existent problem, what's the point? <coughs> it's not going to help anyone. Okay? So very, very clearly, if they don't identify a problem, or if they identify what you think is not a problem, challenge them on that. But most of the time, a decent government team will have identified the problem. It's not enough for you just to stand up and go, they didn't identify a problem, we win, and sit down. You're still going to have to do more than that. So you then need to think about, okay, even if, and this is where we get into this even if structure of questions, even if they have <coughs> given us a problem, is it a problem that we can solve? Not every problem can be solved. If opening girls stand up and say, the problem we have identified is global poverty. Well, yes, that's clearly a problem. I'd love to hear a model in seven minutes that can solve global poverty. I think we've been looking for one for a couple of hundred years now. Still not got one. I see more problems than just that one. Poverty, to me, is a relative thing. As long as you have rich people, you will have people who, by comparison, are poor. So unless you're prepared to eliminate the concept of a capital structure, you're never going to get rid of poverty per se. You're just going to shift what is poverty. So not every problem in the world can be solved. Some problems, it may not be <coughs> desirable for us to solve, because that might create further problems. If we solve the absolute problem of poverty, what situation do we end up with? If nobody's poor, nobody's rich. Everybody is on exactly the same level. That might create its own problems. I don't know. A, a state trying to regulate income to the point where everybody had exactly the same? I think they tried that one somewhere. Didn't work out too well. So some problems just have to exist. They're a natural consequence of other things. So when you're asking as a general question, can we do anything about it? Is this going to work? You're not specifically thinking about their model. You're thinking about the overarching problem that they claim to have identified. You also want to look at this <coughs> idea of harms and benefits. Who benefits under their model, and who, by definition, will get harmed? You cannot benefit some people and not harm others. It's a binary equation. One side goes up, the other side must go down. Otherwise, government have found some magic pot in the woods where they can just get good things out, and there's no downside to it. Now, it would be lovely if government could find such a magic pot in the woods. But those magic pots don't exist. Governments have limited resources. They have limited time. They have limited money. They have limited manpower. Not as limited as smaller enterprises, but it's still limited. If government is going to spend a lot of money on one thing, it's got to take that money from somewhere else. If government is going to spend a lot of money on one thing and doesn't want to take it from somewhere else already in the budget, it's got to raise taxes. So there is always going to be a trade-off between what they are attempting to do that is good and negative effects that might be produced. And we'll talk in more detail about harms afterwards. There may be 
a better way of achieving what they want to achieve. Not a better model that solves their specific problem. But if they say, what we want to promote in society is equality. And so they do give you some crazy model about making sure everybody's on equal income and things like that. Well, there are different kinds of equality, some of which might be more desirable than others. Equality of treatment is very different to equality of opportunity. Both of them have negative aspects. <coughs> What's the negative aspect of equality of treatment? Anyway, a negative aspect of the equality of treatment. Well, what if I treat you and somebody in a wheelchair in the same way? Is that fair? No. no it's Why not? Because everybody's different and they have their own needs. Yeah. So if I say to everybody, come on, everybody walk up the stairs, that's equality of treatment. That's really unfair on the people who are stuck in wheelchairs. So equality of opportunity then might be more important because we can see manifest difficulties with equality of treatment. The only way you can treat everybody equally is to reduce everybody to the lowest common level. So if one person can't walk, you make everybody else unable to walk. If one person can't see, you make everybody else unable to see. That's the only way you can get a genuine equality of treatment. There's a wonderful story about this by a guy called Kurt Vonnegut, an American-German writer who wrote a very famous book called Slaughterhouse Five. And in a collection called Welcome to the Monkey House, he wrote a short story about a chap called Harrison Bergeron. And Harrison Bergeron lived in a utopic society where everyone was equal. Harrison was unlucky because he was born more than equal. He was born good-looking, intelligent, fit and sporty. So the government made him wear a bag over his head so he didn't offend all the ugly people. And they put big speakers on each side of his head that would blast white noise into his ears so he couldn't develop logical thought processes because he was too intelligent. And then when they found out he was really good at athletics, they tied big weights around his ankles so he couldn't run faster than anybody else. It's not really fair, but it's equal. Everybody's got the same. So if we then think about equality of opportunity, we have to think about manifest inequality of treatment, don't we? Because for the guy in the wheelchair to have the same opportunity as me, people have got to do more for him. They've got to build ramps rather than staircases. They've got to put in elevators <coughs> so he can get to the top floor of the building. <coughs> On a more realistic level, equality of opportunity might mean that you treat people who are applying to university very, very differently. An example in, in the USA, people who come from the public school system in inner cities should probably be allowed to get lower scores on their SATs because they haven't had the advantage of a private school. Now that's not equal treatment, but you're, we're trying to address the earlier inequalities with further inequalities. So government will always try and say, this is a principle that we are trying to uphold. Is that a principle we want to uphold? Is there a more important principle we want to uphold? Or is there a better way of upholding that particular principle? That's what you should be thinking about as opposition. And then the last overarching question that should run right through the opposition bench is, does this have any practicable effect whatsoever? Yes. What's the problem with equality of opportunity? Okay, somebody tell me, what is the problem with equality of opportunity? What's the problem with affirmative action? You have to advantage to a group. Yeah. And results in the long run, you have someone graduating from the university or the college or whatever that isn't as qualified as another individual, or you have underqualified, under skill, underachievers selected over more competent people for important tasks. Like. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say necessarily at graduation level, because hopefully by then you've managed to redress it. But it certainly breeds resentment. Like if I scored very well in my SATs, and I find out that the one college place I really wanted went to some other kid who got half the scores I did, I wouldn't necessarily understand that was because of the inequality that he suffered earlier in life. It breeds resentment between groups. It fuels unjustified, usually racist arguments 
Affirmative action in the U.S. has been attacked by the right wing. The thing is that there is a problem with the definition of uh, equality of opportunities here, because equality of opportunities it is not giving advantages to the disadvantages. I mean, it is just to try to make, uh, uh, to give to everyone some <coughs> opportunities for developing their uh, skills and their abilities. Absolutely, but. In most places, that means addressing a f an earlier inequality. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to have things like affirmative action. Now, whilst we all understand the need for affirmative action, can I just yes, well, While we all understand the need for affirmative action, there are some people, even within those groups, who say, we don't need your help. We don't need this artificial leg up. There are some black civil rights leaders who say that affirmative action for white people is patronizing and racist because it sends the message that black people can't get there on their own. Now that's a problem. If those people feel that affirmative action is not really helping them, that it's making them a special case. But then that is not the quality of opportunities. That, that, that's the answer, I mean, what you have just said. It is a, a wrong conception of the quality of opportunity. I, I, in, in Venezuela, they passed a, a regulation Mm -hmm. stating that uh, half of the candidates has to be women. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, that's stupid. Why? Because, I mean, what happens if more than half of the, of the candidates are, are women? Mm -hmm. So they are going to limit that only to... But that's, but that's not the quality of opportunity. I mean, uh, that's, a, that's, that's absolutely true. A genuine equality of opportunity, but we can't control the way people understand the term equality of opportunity. And if some people see equality of opportunity as you have to give people an artificial leg up, they can then start to resent them. Now, if you had genuine equality of opportunity, you would never ask for anybody's sex, race, sexual orientation, or age on an application form. But then you fall into unconscious traps, where I look at the names and I think, well, that name sounds like this guy is X, and he's going to fit in well with my company. And very often when we didn't ask people to specify and didn't put photos of themselves on application forms, people would go for names that sounded familiar to them. Because they would think they're going to get people like them. People like people who are like them. It's a basic aspect of psychology. But that's not a problem of the quality of opportunity. That's a problem of humankind. But it's humans we have to deal with all the time. So if we're going to address these problems, we sometimes have to address artificial inequalities or artificial ways of addressing those inequalities. Um, I, I think, personally, you've got fewer problems with equality of opportunity than you have with equality of treatment, obviously. But I do think that it's not without problems because of the way some people react. And we cannot control whether people sometimes misunderstand what we are trying to do. I don't think affirmative action in the US is racist. I don't think it's patronizing to black people to say you have been given so many disadvantages at the start of your life because you're born into economic hardship, you're born into social deprivation, that we accept you can't be expected to have reached this benchmark that we set for entrance to university. But I can also see why somebody who isn't as understanding, who doesn't bother to look at the whole situation, might just think, well, black people get something for nothing. And they may feel, because equally, lots of white people suffer mm -hmm. in economic hardship and social deprivation. But the original affirmative <coughs> action wasn't to help people who didn't have things. It was to help people of a certain skin color because we perceived racism to be a bigger problem than the class divide. Personally, I think the class divide is always a bigger problem. I think a poor white man and a poor black man suffer as much Possibly the black man suffers more, but certainly the poor white man usually suffers more than the middle class black man in American society and in British society. And it yeah. generate inner chances for discrimination. When I ended up high school, I applied for a scholarship mm -hmm. that was directed only to Latin American students. When I sent my information, they sent me back an email saying that I was too Caucasian to apply, so I was not eligible. Yeah. There you go. I applied once to be on an ESU, English Speaking Union, tour of the US, which was for university students. <coughs> At the time, I was a law undergraduate, but I was also 30 years old. I received a very polite letter from them after they called me up to London for interview for two days 
saying that we consider you the perfect candidate for the tour, but you are too old. Because we don't want the American universities <coughs> thinking we are sending clever postgraduates over to win all the debates. So they didn't have a problem with my age. They thought the other people might, and then discriminated against me on that basis. Because they felt that opportunities <coughs> were better given to the young. So as much as we might talk in academic circles about what the nature of equality is, in the real world, people just don't bother to think it through. We project prejudices onto people as well. Mm -hmm. They turn around and said, it's not us, it's them. They won't <coughs> like it. And they're the ones paying for it. And we risk the funding for next year's tour if we send you. I still don't agree, but, you know, I'll get over it. I'm not bitter. <laughs> I get to come here instead, and this is much more fun. <coughs> OK. So let's now look at this idea in some depth of the nature of harms. Because often one of the strongest lines of opposition is to show that the harms that will be produced by the policy outweigh the benefits that have been proposed. Governments will usually try to diminish the nature of harm, or will talk about removing harms and thereby producing benefits. Very rarely will governments be honest enough and brave enough to say, we accept this is going to create harm elsewhere. And even if they do, they try to downplay those. They try to minimize the effects of what they are saying. Now, that's government's job. I'm not going to criticize government for doing its job and doing it well. Your job is to notice that, that what they do is through use of language, through use of rhetoric, they use terms that make these harms <coughs> seem irrelevant. If, for example, we look at the ban that exists in most of Europe <coughs> on smoking in enclosed public spaces. This was mostly targeted at bars, restaurants, nightclubs, and things like that. Because very few offices allowed people to smoke in them anyway. So the government will always say, well, this is about preventing harm. Non-smokers are forced to breathe in the smoke of other people. Is that statement true? Let's just think about in the context of bars, restaurants, nightclubs. Are non-smokers forced to breathe in the smoke of smokers? No. Within a nightclub. Hang on, one at a time. You said no. I said no. You said no. I said no because uh, as when they go out, they are they they are going they should be aware that they are going out to an unhealthy environment mm. and that is a bar a club nobody not forces going, them to go to yes, the bar yes they're not it's not school and hospital it's mm. something voluntary yeah nobody forces them to go to a particular nightclub now you might wish if you can government to make an argument that well all nightclubs allow smoking so they don't have that element of choice in the market that's possibly true but government needs to be more elaborate about what they say. If the market notices a need for non-smoking clubs, according to all our free market principles, the market will provide one. Adam Smith tells us this, Hayek tells us this, Friedman swears by this. He says the market will always fill the vacuum. Governments maintain that if you allow clubs and bars to smoke, or to be smoking environments, nobody will open a no-smoking one because there's no economic success in it. Well, that suggests there's no popular support for the ban either, right? So every line of argument government comes up with creates an extra line of opposition. <coughs> when governments talk about banning smoking, and they talk about the dangers of passive smoking, what are the dangers of passive smoking? Cancer, possibly. It's the same effect that uh, the same disease that the smokers can get. Possibly. Maybe even worse because they exhale even worse poisons. Proportional to exposure to smokers. There's never been a single scientific study to prove any link between passive smoking and smoking related diseases. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. Nobody has ever done a properly controlled 
double blind scientific study. It's never been one that's been peer reviewed and published in any scientific journal. It's just accepted that smoking might be bad for other people, but nobody's ever proved it. The only time we've ever noticed correlation is the children of smokers. When parents smoke at home, we tend to see a lot more children with asthma, with respiratory problems. We don't see the same correlation in adults, and adults who choose to spend time around smokers. And yet, when we come to ban smoking because of all the harm it does, we ban it in pubs and clubs where adults choose to go. Where do the smokers then smoke? At home. At home. Who then gets harmed? The kids. The kids, who we know get harmed more often than adults do. Do the kids choose to stay at home and breathe in their parents' smoke? No. No, they don't. So government, by trying to solve a problem, has probably picked the wrong problem to solve, is solving it in the wrong way, and is creating a far bigger problem than the one they're solving. Now these are all really, really strong lines of opposition to the motion we should ban smoking in bars, clubs and restaurants. And yet, almost every European country has accepted the ban, even though these arguments were being made. There's another argument that says, well, we have to treat these people. The state has to provide care for these people when they do get sick. That's possibly true. In a lot of countries, there is some form of state-funded medical care for everybody. Where does the state get its taxes from? Do we tax cigarettes? Yeah. Yeah. Do we tax them at a high level in Europe? Yeah. Yeah. At a ridiculously high level. How much is a packet of cigarettes in Venezuela today? I don't know. Three dollars. Three dollars. In my country, we pay six pounds. That's twelve U.S. dollars. Or no, not anymore. Ten U.S. dollars for one packet of cigarettes. Almost all of which is taxation. <coughs> the NHS budget in the UK is half of what the UK government raises in taxation from smoking products alone. The entire NHS budget. Not just the bit spent on smokers. So smokers aren't a burden on the state. Smokers fund the health care for all the non-smokers. But again, government doesn't necessarily see this. Because it's easier to sell an argument in the media that smoking is bad and we should do something about it. If we focus on the wrong problem to begin with, we miss all the really big arguments later on. <coughs> now, I will admit to a vested interest here, I am a smoker. Although I didn't smoke a single cigarette yesterday. Way go, go me. I didn't even notice that I didn't smoke either, which is the great thing. I didn't want one at all. I didn't crave a cigarette and say, no, I just didn't smoke. Yes. But, sorry, Paul. And of course, easy to know that you're a smoker because, I mean, smokers believe in those arguments. But, even if I didn't smoke, I still think those arguments are better than the ones the government makes. I still think the idea of harming children is worse than harming adults who choose to put themselves in the way of harm. But then where is the responsibility of their parents? But that's what I think we should, there should be. There should be a responsibility of the parents. I don't think it's the state's right to parent the children for the parent. Ultimately, I don't think this is a legitimate action of government at all. I have a lot of non-smoking friends who don't like the ban on smoking. Because a lot of non-smokers socialise with smokers. And we all used to go to the bar together, we'd all sit round a table and some of us would smoke. And then the ban came into place, which meant we had to go outside. Do you know what the non-smokers do? Come outside with us. They don't sit in the bar on their own while all their friends go outside, they come outside as well. So all the dangers of passive smoking, if true, are still there. But now the non-smoker's cold as well. <laughs> because he has to stand outside. The smokers are going to do it because they're the ones who need that nicotine. But the non-smoker now feels attacked by the ban. Not every non-smoker, ultimately. I think it is fantastic that some bars you can go into and the air is clean and fresh and it doesn't smell like stale old tobacco. I think that's wonderful. But I also think the market could provide that if there's a demand. Because I choose on occasion not to smoke. 
I don't want a cigarette after every meal. I don't, certainly don't want a cigarette whilst I'm eating. I think the most ridiculous thing that governments ever did was say, you can have a section for smokers in the same room as non-smokers. You can put all the signs up in the world, but smoke can't read. <laughs> as the smoke drifts across the room, it doesn't go, oh, no further, I'll drift back now. It doesn't do that, does it? It can't. So government is in effect identified what they see as a problem and then presented arguments that only relate to their conception of that problem. <coughs> if we take a very different conception of the problem, then we find lots of arguments against it, possibly arguments that we are happier to make that we certainly feel are more valid and more sound in terms of logic and application. But when we're looking at the nature of harm, we need to consider certain things. And the moral philosopher Peter Singer is very, very useful in this. For once in his life, he's not useful on much else. He's, he's a bit crazy. I don't know if anybody has ever read Peter Singer. He is a moral philosopher to the level that he believes if anything can feel harm, you shouldn't do anything to it. So he doesn't eat certain vegetables where it has been scientifically proven that they scream if you cut them, like lettuces. Did you know a lettuce screams? We can't detect it. It's a sound that's way below our our register. But if we put the right machine next to it, we can detect. Even a lettuce that's been taken out of the ground and kept in the fridge for a couple of days, when we slice through the heart of that lettuce, it screams. And Peter Singer says, therefore, we can't eat lettuce. Peter Singer says, but you can eat oysters. You eat them alive? You can eat oysters alive. They have no central nervous system. They are bivalves. They are not complex beings enough to feel what else suffering. Can we eat? Hmm? What else can we eat? Mussels, anything, any mollusks. Mussels, bivalves, oysters. Um, <laughs> Shrimps. Very hard from the shrimps, I'm not sure where Singer, singer stands on shrimps. Have eyes. I, think you yeah, I, I think Singer might think they were too complex. But you can eat pulses, you can eat fruits. Not much though. Nuts are fine. Nuts he's absolutely fine with. But Peter Singer is much more concerned about the nature of harm and what it means to harm something. And so Peter Singer says, if you cannot reverse harm, that is always worse than harm that can be rectified. And I think that's pretty <coughs> unassailable in its logic. If I cut your hair and you have the wonderful flowing locks, rich and lustrous, and I come along in the night with the scissors and shave all your hair off, that's probably quite damaging to you. But your hair will grow back. Far more damaging if I cut off your leg. Because your leg tends not to grow back. Okay. There are certain animals that can regrow limbs, but we're not one of them. We don't have that auto-regeneration. So irreversible harm is always worse, but how much worse, says Singh? He says, well, you can actually calculate how much worse and thereby produce a coefficient. Because Singer says, and he uses some strange <coughs> mathematical equation, and he says that an irreversible harm is always 1,000 times worse, at least. Now, in terms of balancing harms and benefits, if you are benefiting 1,000 people and harming one person, but that harm is irreversible, Singer says that's equal because of the nature of irreversible harm. Because irreversible harm goes much further than just the harm caused. It harms the wider society. Why does it do that? Well, Singer says, one of the principles of natural justice is restoration. When we punish people for crimes, one of the things we should attempt to do at the same time is put those people who have been victims back in the position they would have been had the crime not occurred. I think that's a perfectly valid argument. I think it's very, very worthy to say, insofar as it's possible, we should attempt to redress the victim. We should attempt some form of redress to say, you have been <coughs> lost something, we should compensate. Now, compensation 
can be in the form of we can give them back their property, in which case the harm is reversed. But an irreversible harm can never be truly compensated. And the reason Singer says it's so much worse than a reversible harm is because it then violates principles of natural justice. And I think on that ground, he's pretty solid. As I say, I don't agree with much of what Singer says. Um, there's another chap, and I'm struggling to remember his name, but he's a, uh, a friend of Singer's, and he's written a book called Animal Rights and Human Wrongs. Um, which is about why animals should be allowed to kill humans, but humans should never be allowed to kill animals. Interesting argument. I'm not sure it's one I buy. But, uh, but most of Singer, Singer's <coughs> philosophy, comes from this idea of his militant vegetarianism, of the nature of harm. So that's irreversible harm. Singer also says we need to play a game of utility. Now, Yesterday, in my elective, I argued that utility was never a good thing to argue in a debate. I'm now going to contradict myself and tell you why it can be. I will also tell you to be aware of the possible pitfalls of utility, and I'll explain what they are. Singer says, as do most utilitarians, that you can measure happiness. You can quantify happiness. I can measure how happy I make you by a certain action and how unhappy I make this person by the same action. And if I make you more happy than you unhappy, way I win. Go me. That's what Singer says. And that's pretty standard utilitarianism philosophy. You can develop it as John Stuart Mill does and say, happy pig, not as important as unhappy Socrates. I think that's a little bit simplistic. I think in terms of just numbers of people who might be harmed, I think it's fair enough to play the utility game. If government identify a small group of people that need help, and then propose taxing everybody else in order to do it, I think that's probably going to invalidate their argument, because of the number of people who would have to commensurately suffer in order for these people to be helped. I don't think you can measure utility in the same way that Mill and Bentham say. Because I think it's axiomatic. Does everybody understand the term axiomatic? A statement that doesn't necessarily require proof. I think it's axiomatic that when you make people unhappy, they remember that for longer than if you make them happy. That's why when you give somebody a pay rise, after it's been in their packet for a couple of months, they don't see it anymore. It becomes part of the status quo. And I always define happiness by where I am at the moment and where I could be. Whereas, make me unhappy, and the memory of that unhappiness will live with me for far longer. So I don't think you can use the utility argument that Mill and Bentham would use, and that Singer seems to agree with, that if you make a small group of people extremely happy and a large group of people only mildly unhappy, that's okay. I don't buy that. Because I think that happiness wears off far more quickly than the memory of the injustice being done. I think there are consequences to unhappiness as a feeling of injustice that are far more wide reaching. And this is where you get to use the utility argument and government doesn't. Because if you can show that even though these people are only mildly disadvantaged, that the long-term effects of that are far more serious, then I think you win the numbers game. Because I think you get to say, hang on a minute, these people might only be mildly disadvantaged, <coughs> but they are being mildly disadvantaged for something that they don't necessarily see the benefit of. We go back to this irrational reaction of some people to affirmative action because they don't necessarily understand the equality of opportunity. The benefit that one person feels having gained a university place by affirmative action is very often lost by the time they finish their first year at university. They've caught up, if you like. The harm that one person feels by losing out their place at university goes on forevermore because they start to mistrust government the state. They start to feel disenfranchised because they feel they have been unfairly picked on. 
People don't like having their taxes put up. Far more than they enjoy having their wages go up. If you put their wages up and their taxes up exactly the same amount at the same time, they don't feel that they're on the same level. They feel more harmed than benefited. Because the idea of the harm lives with us longer and affects more of what we do. So when considering whether people are disadvantaged by a policy, always consider the magnifying effect of that. Minimal harm becomes magnified over time. Maximum benefit diminishes over time. So that they both tend towards each other until the harm always surpasses the benefit. Obviously, the longer the period, the greater the harm. Okay, back to Peter Singer's random mathematical coefficients. Singer also says that not just irreversible harm is 1,000 times worse. He says there's a far worse type of harm. Involuntary harm. Harm where you did not choose to put yourself at risk. According to Peter Singer, this is 10,000 times worse than voluntary harm. Pushing somebody out of a plane, it's far worse than them jumping out. <coughs> I think clearly he's right on that. Singer would also say, adults who choose to go into smoke-filled environments take a risk. Children don't have that choice. <coughs> 10,000 times worse. So even if you can show me 10,000 people who benefit from the smoking ban, I only have to show you one child who doesn't. Now, I'm not sure I agree with the actual mathematical coefficient that Singer uses here. I think 10,000 is maybe just a nice round number that he picked out of the air. But I do think the principle certainly holds. That if somebody does not choose to take a risk and they suffer harm, that is far worse. Particularly if they are put in the way of that harm by government, whose duty it is to protect them. I think if the state's job is not to protect its citizens, it doesn't have any other jobs. Because there's no point doing things for citizens you haven't protected. Because most of them will likely be dead. And there's not much you can do for dead people, in my experience. You know, we've tried bringing them back to life, tends not to work. So, keeping them alive, obviously quite important. But Singer <coughs> says, it's so much more worse than just irreversible harm because of that lack of element of free will. When the state takes away the individual's decision to do something and then chooses to harm them, again, we produce feelings of disenfranchisement. We encourage the idea that the state is not there for you. The state is not there to benefit you or to protect you. That the state is an agent acting against you and your interest. That has profound consequences for the nature of the society in which we live. And those consequences can always be teased out in a debate by a good opposition. You can always look at who is harmed by this and who is harmed in an involuntary manner. <coughs> you may have come across the idea of stakeholder analysis. Has everybody heard that term? Yes. Anybody not heard it? Stakeholder analysis. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stakeholders in the debate are anybody who is affected by the motion. And I would argue, and Steve has heard me argue, that there is nobody on the planet who is not a stakeholder at some level in any debate you care to mention. <coughs> if it's a debate about free university education in Scotland, who is the primary stakeholder? Who are the primary stakeholders? <coughs> <coughs> yeah, students in Scotland. Who's next? Parents. Parents. Students. Academic staff, maybe. A student from everywhere. Other students. Society. Society as a whole. Employers, taxpayers. Everyone. 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 Gets affected. Gets affected. Who's harmed by giving students free university education in Scotland? The state, the taxpayers. Taxpayers, certainly. The universities themselves? Yeah. Because they have potentially less funding? 
who benefits massively? So the students and maybe society. and the parents. What about universities in England? Sure. Where academics go to better funded universities because they're not that dissimilar. Okay. And Scottish universities suddenly have twice as many English students applying. <coughs> now, none of those people chose to put themselves in that position of potential harm. So when we look, talk about harm to those individual groups, their place in the stakeholder hierarchy changes. Because of the involuntary nature of their harm, we need to consider them as more important in the context of the debate. That's a wonderful thing about irreversible and involuntary harm, is it alters who the stakeholder is and where they need to be considered, how important they are within the debate. <coughs> Because it's not just about, oh, well, I can show you 501 people and you can only show me 500. That doesn't matter anymore. Because we know <coughs> that unhappiness will last longer than happiness. Bless you. OK. Let's look at this idea of role of the government. Because quite often in a debate, the government, at some point, whether it's first government or second government, will have to say why doing this is the job of the government. They will have to include some analysis as to why this is necessary. <coughs> what are the roles of the government? Protect its people. Protect its people, absolutely. I think that's a primary role of government, be that militarily or socially. That's why governments have the monopoly of violence. I think that's an important factor in statehood. And that's why governments set laws. They regulate within the society how people interact on the basis of protecting those individuals as best they can. Similarly, they have armies to protect us from our enemies outside. What else should a government do? <coughs> Provide a... Well, this is, this is arguable, but... Should, in my way of seeing, provide a social state where, not a social, I mean, provide equality of opportunity that we would yeah. decide. It should help those who cannot help themselves, let's say. Yes. Share it, prosperity. Share prosperity. Oh, that's yeah, sure, actually. That's sure. a slightly left wing idea. <laughs> I'm very comfortable with the idea that Ashur. government should. Oh, Ashur. Ashur. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said share. No. Yeah, yeah. Assure <laughs> prosperity. Yes, I think it should help people to self-actualize and achieve all they can. I think that's pretty solid. Who here believes that there is a social contract between the citizen and the state? Put your hand up if you believe that. I do. Okay. Do we believe that on a Rousseauian level or on a Hobbesian level? They're very different constructs. Rousseau. Okay. I don't believe in the existence of a social contract anywhere, and I will tell you why. Contracts must be capable of rescission. You must be able to <coughs> end the contract. Can I end my contract <coughs> with the state? You can move to another, can move to another state. Right, but then I'm just moving to another contract. Yeah. Can I opt out of the state-citizen relationship at any point? Yes, you can. If you buy a boat and move to international waters. If I buy a boat and moor it in international waters. That's the only way. Yeah, or buy a private island and declare it Regionistan. <laughs> yeah. But it's very, very difficult for me to opt out. Of the that contract. happens with some contracts too. So. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. That's because most contracts are poorly drafted. But also, contracts have an element of negotiation, agreement. Well. I didn't decide which state I was born into <coughs> or what rights I would choose to give up to the state. Now, Rousseau says we all do choose to give up certain of our rights to the state in return for their protection. I'm not sure he's... I think it's a lovely idea that we all sat around a big table once and went, OK, you're the government, we're the people, let's have a bit of a chat. But, but when you elect... When you elect your government, you have the right of voting, and you sort of have a right to choose which 
government you want. At least maybe not within the, the state, contract. But and that's why you vote is for it? Uh, one person no. to it, is, it is within the contract, but it is it, it is the right you have to choose the government. Again, on a theoretical level, I think that's very true. But when I look at domestic politics in most places, I see very little difference between political parties. Certainly, I don't see any fundamental change in the constitution of government. Very rarely do I see a fundamental change in the constitution of government. Obviously, Venezuela is an example of where you do see that. But certainly in Britain, we don't vote on ideology. We vote for a different CEO of Britain PLC. We vote for a management system, effectively rather than any ideology about whether we should be more liberal or more conservative. All the politicians in Europe seem to be espousing different ideas of essentially the same construct. Your point, sir? Let's go further. If, let's say we don't have an elected government. You're either a monarchy or a tyrant or a tyrannical state of some sort. The fact that you're not trying to oppose the government or change the form of the state implicitly says that you're accepting the state the way it is. Because it's I know it's a hard point to pull because there are consequences of opposing the state. But then again the social contract is not a contract that you enter as an individual. It's a contract that you enter as a group. So, so by definition if I refuse to take the risk of being killed for opposing somebody, I'm allowing I'm saying it's fine. No, I don't think that's true. I think it's possible to dissent from the contract and say, but there are certain risks I'm not going to, because who do I benefit by being slaughtered by that tyrant? Sometimes political opposition just isn't possible. If I'm in Pinochet's Chile, and I know that just by saying in some small cafe in Santiago, I'm not too fond of this guy Pinochet, I know that the consequence of that is a little helicopter ride over the Pacific Ocean, I think, you know what, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I don't think it's fair to say to people, because you didn't speak out, you but deliberately accept it. Then again, you do not enter the contract as an individual. So as an individual, you cannot do anything. So if you're a small enough group not to have any consequence, then you are not representing the whole body that entered into the contract originally. But that, then, that then raises the question about who did enter the contract on my behalf. Again, I don't see it as a valid form of contract. Nobody did. Exactly. So sometimes when we come to consider what is the role of the government, governments in debates overstate what government's rights and duties are. And they predicate this very often on this mirage of a social contract. And they say, it's fine, you've all decided that government can do this for you. We haven't, clearly. And it's perfectly legitimate to stand up as the opposition in the debate and say, hang on a minute. I didn't say yes. So challenge whether the government itself has the authority or the right to do so. The last thing we're going to look at, and we're going to cover this very quickly so you get a bit of a break before we come back and do drills, is the idea of models. Models. Yes. The government's actual model, what they are proposing to. Because all that we've talked about in terms of not your job and things like that has been about government more generally. But models, we need to think, what is the effectiveness of this model? Will this specific model go any way to solving the specific problem that has been identified, even if we accept that the problem is correctly identified? <coughs> how far will the model go to solving the problem? If it won't solve the problem, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of money, it's a waste of resources, it's a waste of energy. Are there alternatives to the model? Can you think of a better way of achieving this? Different to the better way of upholding the principle, as we talked about earlier, can we think of a better model? That's what I'd say right until the end. Because if that's your best argument, then you've made far too many concessions to what government has said in terms of principles and why something needs to be done. So that's your absolute last resort is, we can think of a slightly cheaper, slightly quicker model. Okay? But it's still a legitimate line of opposition. Is the cost justified? Again, not the greatest argument in the world, one that you might want to keep in reserve if you're desperate and can't find anything else. Don't, please, ever stand up and say, this money could be spent somewhere else. Well, of course it could, that's just truistic. 
And most oppositions who are poor will say, we could spend this money on health. Because in Britain, we've always got a deficit in the health budget, despite the fact that as smokers, we give billions to the government. So don't just run the, we could spend this on something else, but look at the amount of money being spent, and again, compare it to the amount of benefit being produced. If that money is being spent on a very small special interest group, and you're having to tax everybody in order to raise it, that might not be justified. Look at the specific agent within the model. Not government's right to do something, but the classic agents, for example, in intervention debates, this house would intervene in Democratic Republic of Congo. Who might you choose as the agent? The UN. The UN, EU, NATO, some international group that might have competency. But there are problems with every agent. If you pick the UN, what are the two biggest problems with it? Vetoes on the Security Council, the classic third argument in every debate, China won't like it. <laughs> and the speed with which things get done at the UN. Yeah. It takes ages to get a resolution. Don't fall into the trap of thinking only Russia and China are the problems on the Security Council. Which country has exercised the veto more than all the others put together yeah. since yeah. The USA? Yeah. Regarding? Israel. Israel. Absolutely right. They have vetoed more resolutions just on Israel than the, U the USSR, China, Britain, and France have vetoed altogether on all the other countries. Okay? So don't be <coughs> fooled into thinking that it's just Russia and China. If we pick NATO, what's the problem? Well, we overcome the problem of speed of resolution because NATO acts far more quickly than the UN does. We've overcome the veto problem because Russia and China aren't in NATO. But what's the problem with NATO? It is a military organization. It's a military organization. It doesn't do peacekeeping or humanitarian intervention. It doesn't necessarily have agency or competency in those areas. It might also be seen as being part of the Western imperialist hegemony. It tends to be US dominated. It is certainly US funded to a great degree. It was designed initially to provide US protection for Eastern European states at risk from attack from the former Soviet Union. So whilst you might solve the problems that you encounter with the UN, you create other problems. If you pick the EU, again, you've got other problems. The EU doesn't have a unified fighting force. How can it intervene on that level? If you pick a coalition of the willing, like we did to go to Iraq, there are obvious problems that I don't need to outline with that sort of stance. If we go for John McCain's imaginary League of Democracies, which I think is great, I think you should have just called it the Justice League of America and have them all wear superhero costumes. That would have been awesome, that really would. Okay, so that's a little bit about agency. And together with agency is speed. How quickly can something be done? This also goes back a little bit to harms, is the immediacy. Is the harm going to be produced straight away, or will it not happen? If it's not going to happen for a couple of years, why are we doing something now? Okay? If we don't do something now, will the harms be greater? Those are all things that a good opposition needs to consider. They are not all going to be as applicable in every debate. Remember, you're only having to deal with seven minutes of stuff. You don't need to rebut every single line that the government says. This is not US policy debating. Okay. okay? Just because government has one argument standing at the end of the debate doesn't mean they've won it. If you've taken down their major arguments, because you will have some argument standing at the end of the debate. Often both sides will have some argument standing, because not every argument clashes directly. Some of them just bypass each other and not, not entirely mutually exclusive. So don't worry about how I knock down absolute. If you can knock down everything, then great. But you don't want to spend four of your seven minutes rebutting stuff that doesn't need rebutting. You get no credit for blowing over a straw man. Okay? So focus on what you see as the important elements of government's case, deal with those, and then move on to bringing a substantive line of opposition, a principled line of opposition. Okay? Guys, take five minutes and I'll see you back in here for drills. <laughs>